First Days Amongst the Contrabands by Elizabeth Hyde Botum Read by Frank Blissett Chapter 1 Within the Lines Why did I first go within the lines? This question is often asked with the addition, Tell us about it. The military movements connected with the Civil War are well known, but the great mass of American people know but little, and so think less, of that other great event, the greatest in the history of the world, the emancipation of four million human beings held in bondage in the southern states. A new race was born into freedom, with no preparation or provision for the great change. That this could be accomplished without disintegrating the whole federal government is unprecedented in history. A new generation has come to the front. The men and women who were in active life in 1860 are fast falling out of line. The ranks are broken. But few veterans can now respond to the roll call. Let us tell our stories before it is too late. Wonderful strides have been made in the political and business world since the war. No wonder people who were infants then, or have been born since, listen to stories of those stirring times, and, before the war, with surprise and incredulity. The ex-slaves are no longer freedmen. They are Negroes. The name of contraband has no significance. It is, at best, only a local terra. In the meantime, these ex-slaves have doubled in number and increased in capacity and intelligence a hundredfold. How was slavery regarded? In 1861, Alexander H. Stevens, vice president of the Southern Confederacy, said, the prevailing ideas entertained by most of the leading statesmen at the time of the formation of the old Constitution were that the enslavement of the African race was in violation of the laws of nature, that it was wrong in principle, socially, morally, and politically. These ideas, however, were fundamentally wrong. They rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This is an error. It was a sand foundation, and the idea of a government built upon it. When the storm came and the wind blew, it fell. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Jefferson Davis, President of the Southern Confederacy, said in his message, April 29, 1861, In a moral and social condition, they, the slaves, have been elevated from brutal savages into docile, intelligent, and civilized agricultural laborers, and supplied not only with bodily comforts, but with careful religious instruction under the supervision of a superior race. 
their labor has been so directed as not only to allow a gradual and marked amelioration of their own condition, but to convert hundreds of thousands of square miles of the wilderness into cultivated lands covered with a prosperous people. Towns and cities have sprung into existence, and it, the country, rapidly increased in wealth and population under the social system of the South. While the Southern leaders were thus defending slavery, and the mass of Southern people were trying to tighten their chains, many Northerners were hotly declaring that slavery had nothing to do with the war, nor would the war touch the divine institution of slavery. At the same time, freedom, like the soul of John Brown, was steadily marching on. Charles Sumner, that great champion for justice and humanity, said, Look at the war as you will, and you will always see slavery. Never were the words of the Roman orator more applicable. No guilt unless through thee, no crime without thee. Slavery is its inspiration, its motive power, its end and aim, its be-all and end-all. It is often said the war will make an end of slavery. This is probable, but it is surer still that the overthrow of slavery will at once make an end of the war. It is not necessary even, according to a familiar phrase, to carry the war into Africa. It will be enough if we carry Africa into the war in any form, any quantity, any way. These extracts show the spirit of the times. The whole country was intensely aroused. When the war broke out, public opinion was like the waves of the ocean in a tempest, rushing up and down, seething, roaring, hissing. Slavery People at the North knew but little of slavery as it existed in the United States seventy-five or even fifty years ago. It was a terra incognita to them. When brought face to face with the slaves, as they were during the war, it was like the discovery of a new race. I do not mean politically. Everybody knows something of the politics of the times. History gives us the facts. What was known of the slaves themselves? Had they any individuality? Were they, as we were often told, only animals with certain brute force, but no capacity for self-government? Or were they reasoning beings? I do assure you, once said a southern woman to me, you might as well try to teach your horse or mule to read as to teach these niggers. They can't learn. Then, said I, will you be so kind as to tell me why they made stringent laws at the South against doing what could not be done? Oh, the laws were made to protect the house servants and town niggers. Some of these were smart enough for anything. But the country niggers are like monkeys. You can't learn them to come in when it rains, was her flippant answer. This was said to me just at the close of the war. Her statement refuted itself. Not an uncommon thing in those unsettled times. Negro schools had then been started with marked success. To a casual observer, the slaves seemed to be a careless, easy-going race, 
governed by impulse and as contented with their present condition as they could be in any other. Many good people who saw them only in holiday array were deceived by their manner. Hence such books as South Side View of Slavery and others were written in defense of the institution. The slaves of the town were mostly a merry, rollicking set, active and alert. The country people and field hands were more apathetic. They were, apparently, indifferent, unobservant, and uncommunicative. How was it among themselves? In every community, on every plantation, there were more or less restlessness and dissatisfaction among them. They well knew their condition as slaves. They knew, too, the possibilities of freedom somewhere beyond the line of the southern states. In the earliest days they had their secret societies, their leaders and earnest advisers. Long before anti-slavery societies were recognized at the North, or abolitionists became the bugbear of the South, the slaves met in swamps at midnight and planned and plotted to break their chains. Freedom was the North Star, towards which their faces were constantly turned. There are those of the older generation who can remember the Denmark V.C. insurrection, which only failed at the last moment. Without any knowledge of newspapers or books or telegraphy, the slaves had their own way of gathering news from the whole country. They had secret signs, an underground telephone, like the Underground Railroad, which was of later date, also unknown and unnoticed limited express messengers. Intuitively they learned all the tricks of dramatic art. Their perceptions were quickened. When seemingly absorbed in work, they saw and heard all that was going on around them. They memorized with wonderful ease and correctness. The Negro mind had never been cultivated. It was like an empty reservoir waiting to be filled. Under their calm exterior was always a smoldering volcano ready to burst forth. Of course, the sharpest and most unscrupulous overseers were needed to watch the slaves, while bloodhounds were kept to track fugitives. Not long ago I heard some negro women talking of old times over their sewing. One said, My father and the other boys used to crawl under the house and lie on the ground to hear Massa read the newspaper to Mrs. when they first began to talk about the war. See that big oak tree there? said another. Our boys used to climb into that tree and hide under the long moss while Massa was at supper, so as to hear him and his company talk about the war when they come out on the piazza to smoke. I couldn't read, but my uncle could, said a third. I was waiting maid, and used to help Mrs. to dress in the morning. If Massa wanted to tell her something he didn't want me to know, he used to spell it out. I could remember the letters, and as soon as I got away, I ran to Uncle and spelled them over to him, and he told me what they meant. I was attracted by this, and asked if she could do this now. Try me, missus, try me and see, she exclaimed. So I spelled a long sentence as rapidly as possible, without stopping between the words. She immediately repeated it after me, without missing a letter. The children of this woman were amongst the first to enter a freedman's school during the war. 
They took two books as ducks take two water. The youngest, a boy, was really entered when a baby in his sister's arms, and was only allowed to remain because his nurse could not come without him. As soon as he could walk, his mother complained he did not know anything. When he was three years old, she was bitterly disappointed that he could not read. Why, if I had his chance, she exclaimed, rolling up her eyes and stretching out her hands, do you think I would not learn? It goes without saying that her children became good scholars. This youngest boy is now a leader amongst his own people. Many thrilling stories have been written of the struggles of these poor creatures to secure that liberty which is the foundation and bulwark of our Constitution. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are born free and equal. Others of these stories will be written and read in the future. In each little district were pathetic histories proving that truth is stranger than fiction. Uncle Tom's Cabin, with its vivid pictures of the conditions and possibilities of slavery in the first half of this century, was eagerly read by all who could get hold of it. At the South, it was tabooed. Postmasters refused to let it go through their offices. Whether this was an edict from higher officials, I am not able now to say. In 1850, I happened to be in central Georgia. A copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin was sent me. It was taken from its wrapper at the post office and eagerly read by the postmaster, his clerk, and all of the young men of the town. Then word was sent to me that the book had been received and thrown into the fire which would be the fate of all other incendiary documents. Half the world who read this book denied its truthfulness, and the other half tried to forget it. Then came the Fugitive Slave Bill. There was a fierce struggle for humanity at the North, and determined resistance at the South. A battle was pending between might and right. Slavery was tottering. In the meantime, the slaves as a race were seemingly oblivious to all that was going on. But, in fact, they well understood who were their friends and what they were doing for them. So they watched and prayed and waited in hourly expectation. All of their spirituals, their shouting songs, had freedom in some guise or other as a refrain. We must fight for liberty in that new Jerusalem, was their Marseillaise. These people knew from the first of all the talk about states' rights, secession, etc. When the Southerners were in secret session, plotting dissension, the slaves were also holding secret meetings, planning for their own escape. There are many instances of the slaves' heroic devotion and self-sacrifice to their masters' families, while they were devoutly praying in secret for the overthrow of the rebels and success of the Unionists. That was Chapter One, Within the Lines, from First Days Amongst the Contrabands, by Elizabeth Hyde Botum, read by Frank Blissett.